what procedure we perform? Umbilical hernia repair with mesh. Confirmed. We identify the patient by name, birth date, and resolve any discrepancies. Confirmed. 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 Vocal. I'm going to spoil a joke that one of my great attendings likes to give. Father and son are in a car accident. The father dies at the scene. The son is rushed to the emergency room. The emergency room doctor comes into the room and says, oh my gosh, that's my son. And then the question is, how is that possible? He asked the, the student with me, how is this possible? Like, oh, oh, well, maybe it's like the stepfather or, or maybe he's adopted or, or even it's two gay dads. But never do they get to, oh, it's, it's, it's the mom. Never, never, they, this obviously drives me nuts. Anyways, there has to be a change. Uh, there, I mean, this is, this, women have been doctors for, for, for decades now. There were female doctors in the 1900s, we just didn't talk about them much because it was shameful and they were considered uh, women of ill repute back then. It should just be a fact by now. It shouldn't have to be something that's celebrated. I am happy that it's being celebrated. But we should have moved on by now. I've been a neurosurgeon now for almost 24 years. It's been a wild ride. <laughs> Once I got into medical school, I had the opportunity to actually watch a brain operation for the first time. The moment they expose the live brain, you see it there, it's pulsating, it's real. It's the organ that exists in this cranial cavity, this hard skull that no one can see. I got hooked. I think I enjoy it because the satisfaction that we get from being able to physically, through our hands, affect people who have very significant problems, uh, brain tumors, spinal problems, and, and head trauma. And sometimes, and maybe even a fair amount of the time, we cannot do things that will help get them better and that's something we also have to be able to deal with during the course of our careers. The surgery is still on for the 13th and we already have the implant that arrived from Italy so it's actually at the hospital. The MRI was done on the 18th? Good, mm -hmm. okay. okay let's take a look at that. Yeah. You had you know some of what they thought was uh, swelling but the swelling has come down. But I do think that during the operation, we may have to put a drain in the ventricle temporarily mm -hmm. so that we can make sure that the implant fits over the skull defect properly. Okay. 20, 30 years in the past, there was that perception that women had, if they're gonna be one of the boys, they have to sort of act like one of the boys. I don't think we need to do that. We are free to be ourselves. When I was in the process of trying to figure out why I didn't match in neurosurgery, I was calling around to various program directors. And I got one answer from somebody, oh, you're just too feminine. And then I got another answer from somebody else that you really need to be a son of a bitch, all right? And you know, that's the only way you could be a neurosurgery if you are a son of a bitch. And I'm like, well, I'm not. <laughs> you know, I'm a pretty nice person, I guess. I mean, I, but that doesn't preclude me from doing what I wanna do. Why do I have to be mean to be a neurosurgeon? And we're talking when I was applying was in 80, uh, it was in 1988. That's not so long ago, but yet maybe a lifetime ago in terms of attitudes about women. And I think that nowadays, that notion of you have to be mean to be a neurosurgeon is really out the window. Decades back, if you thought about surgeons, you might not think of uh, empathy and caring as uh, the highest, uh, most obvious way to describe them. I lived in a discriminatory world when I was training in surgery and it didn't bother me. I didn't, it wasn't something I thought about very much till my career progressed. And uh, think about the microaggressions to which I contributed. And uh, that's going to influence patients and colleagues and staff and that's poison. Ellen, are you hungry? I figured if I cut it up like that, it would cook really fast, which it did, obviously, but did not work. I agree with you. 
If I was starving, I would have been that time. <laughs> starving person. Protein rich. Full of salt. I graduated from medical school in 1977. My class at NYU was a big class. It had about 170 people, and about 35% were women. So that was already revolutionary. But uh, it was a little different when you went down the line toward the surgical specialties. There were one or two women in the five years of general surgery. When I graduated as a chief resident after five years, it was five males. I can't think of a single woman on the faculty in the surgery. You have 50% of women who are medical students. We don't want to just attract the best and the brightest men. We want to attract the best and the brightest, period. The people who do well have a positive attitude, mm -hmm. and then you can do anything you want. Yeah. I never have words to describe how mm -hmm. grateful I am with you. To be in that moment, to take care of my kid. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My mother instilled in me the concept of taking your career as far as it can go. She still had an attitude that anyone can do anything that they want, but she's a remarkable woman in the sense that she had that forward thinking and she herself was a homemaker. I think she wanted for me something more and she said to me, you're gonna be a doctor. I said, okay. <laughs> I took that to heart, I guess, ultimately, because uh, here I am, you know, all these years later, uh, having lived that particular dictum and dream. I am a third year surgical resident. We cover traumas during the day and operations as we're assigned. But because general surgery is so broad, our training needs to be across a broad spectrum. As a third year, I'm sort of entering my senior years where I have more autonomy, able to direct in terms of patient care and unable to make surgical decisions within the OR with guidance. I've always sort of been interested in the how and why of people, why people do the things that they do. What I love about medicine, it's just this beautiful interplay between the sciences and humanities in a way that can be theoretical, but it also can be applied. I thought I could parlay my skill set into something that would help people in a real way. What's going on? I remember my first day of rounds. I felt like I was on a roller coaster because I just had no idea and I was overwhelmed and I didn't ever think I would get to a period where I'd be competent enough to look at the list, say, oh, these are the patients, this is what we're gonna do, let's move on. It's a lot of responsibility. And being more competent every year is something that I look forward to. And that's a lot of hard work, but it's worth it, I think, at the end of the day. I wanna do something with my hands, I wanna fix something, and surgery is something that you can go in and you can do something active and fix it. That might be a touch of hubris, but that is sort of what I want to do. I wanna be the person fixing the disease. For students that are coming out of medical school now, we have a generation of men that are more accepting of women as their colleagues. And it's not equal throughout the country. We need to be able to have policies in order to be able to retain women. We need to see a consistent and persistent presence of women in leadership positions because then that makes a difference in what you see driving women towards the profession and seeing what can be achieved in that profession. American surgical training evolved from a model in Europe where residents lived in hospitals and weren't married and were fired if they got married. And it was inordinately hi hierarchical. 
you know, there were certain stereotypes that had a grain of truth, which was uh, surgeons as uh, bullies. That just wasn't going to work in a world where people became increasingly uh, conscious of uh, uh, their autonomy. Look at these quotes from Purcell Bailey. Dr. Cushing taught me nothing directly. He only snarled and made nasty <laughs> remarks when I made a mistake. If he found he could hurt you, he took a malicious, sadistic pleasure in watching you squirm. I know, residents, it's all thought balloons, like, oh, well, nothing's changed. I <laughs> truck, whatever, it was worse. <laughs> the best way to have a professional, safe environment is in um, real opposition to the idea of an imperious surgeon who's allowed to behave any rude way he wanted just get the job done in, in a bullying way, uh, being a, you know, mean or sometimes even vicious to trainees. It's recognized not to be safe. A woman in surgery, without question, had to withstand an awful lot and uh, things that uh, really left her out. Friendships get made in the locker room and job opportunities get mentioned in locker rooms. And, uh, the women got left out. Yeah, surgery is an old boys club. It has been, it is evolving. While it is evolving, there are certainly relationships that are pre-established, things that make it easier for guys to navigate better than women, just because there are more men in surgery than women. It was certainly a consideration, sort of, oh, well, this is a characteristic of the field, but I am of the sort of hopeful and possibly naive mindset that it should be the personality taking care of the patient that governs it. My philosophy is if you can take care of the patient, you can make the clinical decisions, you have the surgical expertise, you can have the technical ability, and you can interact with the patient with a compassion that is due to any other human being, then you should be able and should be given the right to take care of a patient. I am a thoracic surgeon. When I did my first surgery rotation, it was just, there was no going back. I immediately fell in love with the fast pace of it. By the time we were done and I looked, I thought it was like two o'clock and it was actually eight. And it's just how quickly time passes when you're doing something you love. My parents are Ecuadorian and it was a little bit of a struggle growing up. We grew up on the Upper West Side. My dad was a cab driver all his life, and then my mom was a seamstress. There's certain things in Ecuadorian culture that are shared with other South American, Central American cultures, so I think it helps just understanding our background, our roots, and what that means for healthcare, what that means for trusting doctors, what that means for, you know, believing in medicine. Le vamos a hacer la biopsia del pulmón. Sí, en la parte izquierda. Cuando se despierte la cirugía, va a tener un tubito que eso va a drenar aire y líquido. Mientras el pulmón se está sanando, es, ese tubo se, se va a mantener ahí. Bueno, en tus manos estoy. Gracias. ¿Tiene alguna pregunta? Está bien. Ok. lo que Dios quiere, ¿sabes? For patients, primarily that speak Spanish, gives it a little extra Oh, okay, you understand what I'm going through because it's not the same to have somebody translate through the phone. To have somebody explain in your own language what it is is very helpful. Uh, Mi mamá es de eh, Pijuyo. Usted me dijo de, de dónde? De Quito. I love the relationships that I build with these patients. This is somebody's family member. And if it was my family member, if it was my mom, if it was my dad, how would I want somebody to talk to them? How would I want somebody to explain things to them and be honest with them? I need to be understanding of that and I need to sort of be sensitive to that. There is some degree that women have to do a little bit more to get recognized. You gotta have that one line, like if your boss comes into the elevator with you, what are you gonna say in that 30 seconds? I think women are really notoriously poor at that. We kind of feel that people should be recognizing our merit and not having to, you know, constantly tell people what we're doing. 
And that's something that over time we learn. And maybe sometimes we learn the hard way because a more assertive male might get more. Those things have not yet really changed as much as we would like them to. Women, unfortunately, may have to work a little harder at getting the things that we want. So this young man had a work-related accident, fell down an elevator shaft. He ultimately had his bone flap replaced, but then we noticed that there was resorption. He had some wound problems because he's still having some swelling, and now he's here for cranioplasty with a, with a synthetic implant. And uh, with any luck, we don't see the brain during this operation. Women are great surgeons, fantastic surgeons, because of technical ability. There was a potential prevailing attitude that of a woman who seemed small and you know thin, and does she really have the stamina? Can she really do the job? And that's a ridiculous thought because if this is what she wants to do, you know, there are pretty slight women that are really pretty darn strong. Uh, there's an aspect of surgery that is about competition. And not with other people, though I'm sure some people have that, but it's competition with yourself. I look forward every year to being able to say, oh, I didn't know this last year. I didn't understand why this was happening last year, but now I do. Right, right, right. Yeah, you're coming. A little too close. Yeah, 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 you have to be the same distance, you know. Wider, wider. Better, much better. I think that there should be some reflexive thoughts that demonstrate our progression as a society. There should be a progression in our common parlance that this is a doctor, hello doctor, not, I can't tell you how many times, oh, lady doctor, which is a cute phrase and it's mostly from, you know, the elderly who are like, oh, there's a lady doctor, it's so great, and it's like an 80 year old grandma, it's lovely. We should just blink and say, hey, that's great, are you a good doctor? That's what I should care, and that's how it should be. Do you have a marking pen? I definitely have experienced the walking into a room with a male nurse or male PA and they definitely assume, even after I say I'm doctor so and so, they assume the men are the doctors. It doesn't bother me. I like the reactions I get, I like the surprise and sometimes I like the, oh, they don't expect me to be who I am I guess. <laughs> I loved surgery so much that I just went for it and I knew that I could do it. It was never a problem for me to think like, whoa, what am I going to do if there's no women in this? I'll be it. I'm going to cut this. It's going to be left upper lobe wedge for culture. This is for permanent for culture. I definitely don't feel that men have more stamina as I operate till two in the morning most of the days. It takes the person, your want to do something, your want to finish something, caring to do the right thing for the patient. And I think that comes with male or female and not necessarily strength or testosterone. I think our energies are the same. There are things that I may think about coming from my backgrounds that my colleague may not. It's the same principle extended out across genders, across races, it's the same thing. Different experience increases our ability to take care of patients. I think a monochromatic unilateral approach to taking care of the patient is already long dead and gone, it's expired. Diversity of population is in the U.S., it should be reflected in our healthcare system. It's simple. If you're seeing more minorities in the workforce, and women being a minority in these surgical subspecialties included, ultimately you decrease the health care disparity. And I think this is a global issue that could be resolved very well by diversifying the workforce. You can open the, the implant. We shouldn't be categorizing women and men as masculine and feminine anyway. You know, we now have more ideas about what gender is about, and that's really not what it's about. It's really about, are you competent to do the job? And you have patients that trust you. 
If we want to trim something off to make it fit, we're probably best doing it on the native bone. The hot topic now is microaggression, the little things that happen. It exists everywhere, even in the most tolerant environments it exists. We shouldn't have just tolerant environments, we should have fully accepting environments. Anyone should feel safe to pursue their dreams without fear of discrimination or harassment. My name is Shreja. I'm a second year medical student and I'm interested in pursuing a surgical residency after medical school. People's image of a surgeon is not one of someone that looks like me. And it's not my fault, it's not their fault. It's just what's always been. <laughs> I think a lot of people have this misconception that being a surgeon is incompatible with motherhood or that maybe you need to choose a specialty where you're not gonna be so looked down upon for being a woman. Those questions deter me less when I have examples of people like Dr. Ullman and a few others that are able to kind of prove them wrong. It's almost like a teenage mindset, you know, when someone tells you like, oh, you can't do that, you, you want to do it more. <laughs> um, you want to prove them wrong. <laughs> wow, a lot of people end up going to the West Coast, like way more than I thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the time that we're entering this career is going to be so different than it was for people of the other generations. As much as, you know, there are things that we might fear might happen later down the line, like it's almost easier to be hopeful now because chances are like there's at least one female resident on the surgical mm -hmm. team and like there's going to be people here that were before me that can yeah. give me that advice and set the stage for me. And I'm excited to like be that doctor where it's like maybe in the beginning of my career patients will come in and be like oh you're you know a lady <laughs> and by the end they like you know they won't bat an eye and it's just up to our generation to yeah, I know. try to make those changes. Yeah. If you were advising a medical student, will she have a robust, fertile field with role models? And the answer is yes, as the years pass. I think we've come a very long way, and uh, we have further to go. Because many women are conscious of this effort and are outspoken about it, that will push it forward, and it'll be self-propelled. How are you feeling? I'm okay. Good. Can you raise your arms like that? Good job. You were scheduled for the MRI, but we canceled it because your CAT scan at the hospital yes. uh, recently actually looked good. Thank okay. you so much. All like right. the last few times, air hug. Air hug, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Roman. If this is your dream, follow your dream, and then things will fall into place. If it's what you love, what you enjoy, do it. If you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, and it's definitely doable. Nobody should tell you otherwise. There will be people who may not want to make it easy for you because you're a woman or because you're minority or because you're coming from somewhere that most people don't expect. But it's not about them. It's not about those people who don't want you to be here. They can, they can go. It's about you. If people are discouraging you from reaching your dream, well, then you're not talking to the right people. Women are doing this, and now we need to show that publicly so that the young people coming up know what's possible. We can sit here and talk about how these fields are male-dominated forever, but that's not gonna change unless we're the ones to say, okay, that's not gonna stop me from wanting to do it. When there is a first year medical student that comes to the hospital for the first time and is thinking all these things about, oh, surgery is so male dominated and it doesn't fit a lifestyle that a woman might want to have, they'll see us and say, okay, maybe that's not true anymore. Maybe one day we'll get to a point where this isn't even a question that people are asking.